Hey folks, this is Rabble Ross and Rich Bergeron. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Tornado Tony Pentecost. Yeah. I can Tom Tazer with a sh- bright shiny crystal ball. Hey, Donald, I told you that was great last week. Caleb won. Caleb definitely won. Caleb beat the brakes <laughs> off of Caleb. That's what happened. He, uh, my girlfriend was even like, wow, that guy's getting beat up. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if you were looking, because I was following the, the, the punch stats and everything, like for a while, Caleb Truax was only landing average Three punches around. Yeah, average. I think at the end of the fight, I think he a few forties where over twelve rounds he averaged landing four punches around, and that's because Caleb Plant was starting to stand in front of him a little bit more, and you know really trying to back him up. But for the first you know a seven or eight rounds, I mean, it was to the point it was like I think the one round he landed two punches. It was like you know fifteen to two. Um, and you know you can't always go by go by the punch numbers like gospel, but you know you look at it to get a nice yeah. You know it was Caleb Plant was two steps ahead. You know I mean superior hand speed, superior foot speed, um, superior boxing ability. Um, you know he came in there and really dictated what he wanted to do, and he did say after the fight that he hurt his hand, which kind of took him the gas pedal a little bit or it's possible he would have gotten the stoppage because he was really busting him out. Yeah. Well, I think... Yeah, that's true. It would have been... It would have looked better with the stoppage, but you got to wonder about his hand. That's yeah. the only criticism you can say. The, the, the lack of power. Yeah. Um, there's something about his defense I just love. Uh, he's... Like I, I've said before, not a lot of white guys should and can up jab uh, but he does it and yeah. he does it really well And uh, but the only problem with that is you give up a lot of defense if you don't have the best head movement around and that was the only place he was getting hit right. and you could see it very early he had the, like a little a bag under his eye from that <clears throat> um, so one day that could come back to haunt him if he doesn't keep the head movement up uh, so that would be my only criticism uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily think the and, knockout's that important and, and, at his weight class. I think that's just, you know, it's not always nice to have a knockout, but you don't necessarily always need to go for one and put yourself at risk to do it. <clears throat> I thought he had a great fight otherwise. He used um, a potential, you know, down the line uh, opponent for Canelo Alvarez at 158. You know, Alvarez right now is what Mayweather was a couple years ago, the cash cow. You know, if you... You, and ha, it's almost anybody that gets that Cinco de Mayo and then Mexican Independence weekend in September, if you get those weekends, that means you're the, the cash cow. De La Hoya had them for the longest time, and then Mayweather took them over, and then um, then Canelo's then since took them over. Right, so Canelo Plant is a guy that, you know, down the line could be, you know, the Mayweather sweepstakes. And he's got the boxing ability, you know, to give Canelo – you know, challenges. Because if you look at some of Canelo's uh, most difficult performances, the granted some of them were when he was still a little bit green, were guys that were very good boxers. Um, Austin Trout gave him some problems. Uh, Laura gave him some problems. Obviously, Mayweather uh, confounded him. So, like, some of those fights was, were even even Danny Jacobs for a while kept him at bay. Um, so now you've got a guy that's a very slick boxer, uh, very good movement, very quick feet, very very quick hands, um, but at the same time, if you're fighting Canelo in Vegas on one of those weekends, you're going to have to, at some point, go iron, iron for iron, because you know the likelihood of getting a decision is next to none. Um, oh, no. Yeah, exactly. When I was at the um, Canelo-Jacobs fight back in 2019, um, you know, I don't. I thought Canelo won 7-4. Five, because the early rounds where there wasn't a lot of action, I thought Jacobs needed to win them, you know, decisively to get them, and and I thought Canelo did the shade more. So when Canelo got the decision, I thought it was you know fair, and I thought the scorecards were fine. But I remember when I was walking.
checking out because um, I had a shirt on that said Intonator Boxing Philadelphia. And there was a guy behind me that was a, a Philadelphia boxer, and he and I were talking. And he goes, he goes, yeah, the fight was close. He goes, but there was no way Jacobs could have won using that stop. And he just pointed at the people in Mexican boxing. He goes, you weren't going to win fighting a defensive style with, as he said, and he just motioned his hand at the crowd of people. Good point. Yeah. All right. Well, we also had a uh, guy I've seen before, seen him fight before. He, uh, he's he got uh, another win. Um, Rand says Bartholomew. Got a win on the, I believe it was on that undercard. Caleb Plant. And uh, Michael Polite Coffee was not very polite <laughs> to Darmiani Rock there. Darmiani Rock. I got to see that knockout. So I tuned in just that for that. was, you know, <laughs> um, Darmiani Rock, I'm in good shape. No. You know, I got home just as that fight was starting. Um, you know, because I was over at my friend's house. Um, got him just that fight starting, and like I said, you saw pretty much a mismatch. Uh, coffee looked pretty good, you know. Marine Corps guy, in good shape, good puncher. Uh, Darmani Rock was a talented prospect, you know, out of Philadelphia. I don't know if it's, the, you know, the coronavirus, you know, affected his training, affected his conditioning, but I was really surprised and disappointed with the show that he gave. And what was ironic was I was looking at Facebook memories the next day, Look at this. And I said, years ago, I posted a, uh, a photo of an up Philadelphia fight card that we were going to, and Darmani Rock was the co feature. And it was like, <laughs> well, how ironic that we're seeing this today, a night after that he pretty much got uh, pulled out of there. Yeah. Did not look very good. He looked, uh, actually, reminded me a lot of the. Uh the Mike Tyson um, fight against um, the old guy there. Uh, what's his name? He's bl- totally drawing a blank now. Um, fought. Uh, uh, totally when was the when was this Mike Tyson fight? It was in the eighties. Um, the guy just like rolled on okay. his back. Oh, uh, Tony Jones. Older fighter, black, black guy. Uh, well, we had a couple of uh, guys, the Tyson fought. Um, we had Tony Tubbs, who Mike Tyson, he was a, a, a pudgy guy. Tyson flattened him with a left hook and left him in a pool of blood. Um, then you had in the 80s, you also had a fight with, um, oh, what the hell was that guy's name? Uh, uh, well, Jesse Ferguson ended up being a disqualification because he went no, down bigger, and then always did was hold. Bigger name than that. I don't know why I can't think of it, but if you say the name, I'm going to be like, yep, that's it. <laughs> uh, I've got the guy's face in my head. Um, I mean, not Larry Holmes. I mean, Larry, Larry Holmes, fight, yes. So. Larry Holmes. That's what it reminded me of. The way he got knocked out. Because he just <laughs> rolled right oh, yeah. on his back. That, that was definitely a fighting <laughs> cold. But, um, yeah. Bermain Stavern, one of Don King's last guys. Speaking of um, Mike Tyson, <laughs> he uh, went down to Trevor Bryan, who stays undefeated out there in uh, Hollywood, the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino. Trevor Bryan uh, undefeated at 20 0. That was a TKO win. He got taken, taken out pretty good. Pretty much it for boxing. Boxing actually is pretty slow, according to uh, BoxRec. We don't have anything listed for fights until next week. I don't know why that is, unless it's just all Super Bowl. Something to do with the Super Bowl going on. Um, Here's what it is. By the way, Caleb Plant, of his 21 wins, he only has 12 knockouts, so it's kind of par for the course for him to get the unanimous decision. He did knock out Mike Lee. <laughs> well, he was a 
undefeated. But yeah, like I said uh, last week, I've seen him in like really good street fight videos on YouTube. Uh, I forget who shared them. I don't think it was him. Somebody else did. But I saw some some really good technique, <laughs> and that up jab just works even better when you're going against people who have no idea what they're doing. Uh, should never be fighting in the first place. But yeah, that's good stuff. Lucky he didn't get stabbed. Jeez, I mean, he's in some bad news. Yeah, okay. Um, you have to have reflexes, and you have to have good quick in getting it. Another advantage, well, um, two advantages of an up jab. One advantage is you take your left hand, or your lead hand, and normally your left, out of your opponent's line of sight. So you have it down. And we're looking at your... And you bring it up, and then you... You're bringing it out of the coming to come. I'll jab because he's not looking for it. Yeah. It always seems to do the trick when you don't see it coming. Thanks to my last Haven there, I was in um, fighting in Philadelphia, and I was learning that Philly shoulder roll. Now, hey, trust me, I'm not a defensive fighter by any by means, but sometimes they would tell me, you know. Bring your left hand down a little bit, and but use your use your shoulder as your defense, and make it look like you're they're getting a target. What you're trying to make them do is punch. You want them to punch. That way, you can open up your counters. Um, and that's a lot of times you would do that. You know, you would use a, like what it perceives as you know a low guard to entice your opponent to open themselves up. So that's another, you know, potential. If you're a good counter puncher, yes, you want your opponent to punch first. Yeah. Uh, that's your whole plan. you got to entice them to punch. Well, um, here's an interesting story. Derek Chisora and Joseph Parker are trying to get to talking again about a rescheduled fight. And something interesting got in the way of what was supposed to be the original rematch, I guess. A spider bite uh, on his leg. Um, <clears throat> Parker had three-week illness caused a spi- from a spider bite. Um, now I've been still. Oh, I remember that. I've been still doing research on um, Tommy Morrison's case, and uh, there was. Uh, a situation right before he died where he went into the hospital for a spider, after he got a spider bite and it got infected. Um, so it's not it's not like a, such a rare problem. And, and actually, we had a kid at the Air Force Academy. Uh, they warned us about spiders in the, the sleeping bags that they gave us to go sleep out in the field. And we had this really talented, smart kid very tough guy, uh, got got a spider bite. He was sick for a damn week, and, and he wasn't faking it. He didn't want wow. to go home. He was sick for a damn week, and they ended up sending him home because he had lifelong, it looked like he was going to have lifelong effects from it. And he probably got some kind of a settlement in the long run. Cause, you know, It's not his fault at all. He was a totally qualified candidate for the military, and they had to send him home because of a spider bite. So it's nothing to fuck with, you know. Some of those damn things can right. literally kill you. And I've actually seen f- right in front of my face a black widow, a real black widow spider from my work at the newspaper. <coughs> I did a whole story on one. So, and they don't, they're not native around here. They think it actually came off a load of lumber that they got from somewhere. And, it, and the kid that got it, it was crawling on his back. He had no shirt on. And one of his... Uh, work buddies picked it off his back that's how close he oh, came wow. to getting bit and it was so big the guy at the pet store said it was probably a pregnant female <laughs> oh. <laughs> so this kid had it taped up in like a plastic fish bowl <laughs> at his apartment and I'm like you better make sure that sucker doesn't get out buddy he's like yeah I'm gonna pretty much probably sell it to the pet store I said, all right uh, well, well I'll be 
you know, and, and, and Tom, Tom will appreciate this. Um, you know, when, when my dad, you know, him and his, his friend, um, when they were both graduating high school, they were both going to enlist in the military and they were both going to join the Marines. Um, my dad's friend did enlist my grandfather who was, you know, army through and through tore up my dad's enlist papers. And then my dad <laughs> ended up getting drafted. My dad ended up getting drafted into the army. So, um, his friend went through the Marine Corps boot camp and all that. Uh, my dad went through the army, basic training. My dad got uh, sent over during the Vietnam war. My dad was over on the DMZ in Korea. Um, and his friend, um, you know, still his best friend, went over to Vietnam. And now my dad, as we've discussed multiple times, is deathly afraid of snakes. Like when I was watching that Cobra Kai show, when scenes that they had snakes on there, he couldn't watch. He had to actually leave the room. <laughs> he sees a snake on like TV or in a newspaper or in a magazine. He's like and Indiana he Jones. Ill and he'll actually... <laughs> yeah, he's like in the engine. He'll actually throw the, the book out. If he has a magazine, there's a snake in it, and he throws it out. Uh, um, okay. Well, the one night they were sleeping in their tents, and there was one of those, whatever it was over there, a viper or something. Um, I forget what kind. It was one of those they call like a two-stepper. Like as soon as it bites you. Yeah, three, three-step viper. A, a yeah, green thing with a hideous head. Well, it was on his chest. No. Oh. Yeah, no. now, my, my dad probably would have had a heart attack right on the spot and would have died before the snake could have bit him. But they were able to get at the snake off of my dad's friend, and you know, you know, no, no problems ended up occurring from it. I don't know if they decapitated it or whatever they did, but yeah, my dad was like, "Oh, I would have just, I would have woke up, I saw it, I would have died." <laughs> well, you don't want to make any sudden moves. And see, yeah. the problem is, you have to move quiet. In the jungle, a little tip about snakes. They'll avoid you if you make noise out in the forest. They don't want to be around you. They don't want to bite you. We're too big for their food. But when, you sl- when you're sneaking around, if you happen to step on them, put your hand somewhere. Look out. Yeah. Yeah, I bet your dad wasn't uh, a big Sometimes fan of that whole... Sometimes we think that they're killing more of us than the goose were. That old <laughs> Snake Island show there. They just had a reality show on the Snake Island treasure hunt. I bet he didn't watch that. There was one part of it where the, the guy that was the snake handler, they had to officially hire a snake handler who was an expert, and he would go on all the hikes all over the island with him, and, and he passed out in the middle of the hike. It's, uh, you got no snake handler, and you're surrounded by snakes. I mean, they, they were, I don't think I've ever seen an environment with more snakes. I mean, they called it Snake Island for a reason. Oh, I saw, I saw a clip of that on YouTube, you know. But that, you know, oh, oh, don't watch it. Is, is that the one out off, uh, off, off the coast of Brazil? Yes. I think that's uh, the one I'm thinking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. People aren't even allowed on here, from what I understand. Right. Uh, yeah, it's like a pretty dangerous place to even try to dock a, a boat <laughs> to get on it. Uh, yeah. Anyway, moving on to humans instead of. With animals. Yeah, no uh, reptiles. No Jacob Snake Robert. Ryan Garcia has become the first American boxer to land an endorsement deal with Gatorade. Only took him four years. Yes, four years ago. And they finally let him do it. Uh, that's in the news. Now, this is a good one, Tony. We don't talk about wrestling enough sometimes, but um, I could not avoid talking about this one because, you know, it's it's just a classic story. Uh, this guy <laughs> is an ex-NBA ref who got in trouble for basically trying to affect outcomes of games and betting on games. And He's like uh, the Pete Rose of referees, I guess, but I don't know <laughs> if he was as good as Pete Rose as a referee, but uh, I think this article calls it The Fix is In, Disgraced Ex-NBA Ref Donahue returns turns to pro wrestling <coughs> so <laughs> talk about reinventing yourself he gets thrown out of the NBA he gets disgraced loses his job went to jail now the w- WWE is gonna hire him as obviously a bad guy uh, 
and you have to, yeah. going to have to wonder how many so, wrestling so, matches he's going to fix. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's not going to be a referee? He's going to be a wrestler? No. No, he'll be probably a referee. I don't know. I, I oh, okay. Do, he just but signed the contract. So they always do like this gimmick, and they do it like once every so many years. That you'll get a referee that always favors the heels. Back in the eighties, there was a guy named Danny Davis. Every match, he would reprimand the, the um, like the Hulk Hogan's and the Junkyard Dogs, you know, and the British Bulldogs at every chance. But he'd always side with you know, you know the Paul Lawrence and the Hart Foundations and all that. And and then they they banned him, and he couldn't referee no more. So he became a wrestler and this and that. Um, they did it. Back in the nineties, there was always the one referee that was always with the like the Hogan and the um, NWO. Um, so it's always it's always, it's a great gimmick. So now you get a guy and you already bring him in as like you know he's this this disgraced guy. But then they'll put like an angle like oh he somehow got passed through the commission and then and they'll always, and they'll but they'll make a good story out of it you know and hey it's a chance for this guy to you know get, get a get a career going right. He said, uh, whatever they need me to do, I'm a team player. Especially when the team is betting with me. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a team player, especially when it's the team I bet on. Yeah, and he says, I'm more than willing to sit down and figure out what's best for them. It was definitely something that I couldn't turn down, and hopefully it's something in the future I can be part of. In other words, they're paying me a shitload of money. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Uh, anyway. So, yeah. He said about the uh, whole NBA thing, the whole situation is closely pr- is close to probably 10 years behind me now. I'm fortunate that I have a good family and good friends that have supported me. Things couldn't be better. So. Served his time. He gets to be a heel. I don't think anybody can complain about that. Let's see if he does, does a good job. Uh, anyway, that's just one of the quirky stories of the week. Here's one from MMA. Uh, we got to talk about... I, was, I actually had this queued up for last week, but we didn't get to it. Uh, Justin Gaethje is saying he would consider not fighting in the UFC again if Conor McGregor gets the title shot right away after that uh, loss. <laughs> uh, and there's some interesting things going on in the UFC lightweight picture. A lot of guys uh, getting a little bit testy at each other. Uh, Alex Oliveira versus uh, Michael Chandler, I believe, I think is pretty much made now. Oliveira versus Chandler. Have you heard that, Tom? Or has that just been suggested? Well, I I know it's talked about. I I don't know. I'm I'm in my 12-hour a day work time now, so I haven't really caught up up on it, but um, I know that's talked about. I think that's so just about a done deal. I don't know if it's uh, going to be for a title. I doubt it. But um, Conor McGregor pretty much gets whatever he wants, so I would imagine a third fight with Poirier is almost written in stone. Uh, Manny Pacquiao is uh, not fighting Garcia now, I guess, but uh, there are rumblings that there could be a Mayweather rematch. And coincidentally, Mayweather has canceled or postponed the Logan Paul fight and is now p- putting pictures out and hype out about a potential fight with 50 Cent, <laughs> who said if he could make weight, he would fight Floyd Mayweather. He said it before, if he could make weight. So I don't know whether Floyd plans on ballooning up or, or what the plan is for 50 to get down <laughs> to... Uh, Floyd's weight, but uh, yeah, that's supposedly potentially in the works. I don't know how you can't fake that one. Those guys are, I think they've got some type of a a legitimate beef uh, going back a long time, but it was, there was a point in time where they were very friendly. I believe that he was actually there the day I was in the gym uh, when Floyd and uh, Ortiz, we're gonna fight. <coughs> when I was over there, I think he was—he was there at the end. He showed up late. 
But anyway, uh, now he's on the outs with Floyd, and he's, they, I think they've had a little bit of back and forth. But this is interesting. Uh, Gaethje said about the whole situation with Poirier, Connor, for them to come out and say he wants a title shot next, a rematch with Poirier, they're fucking idiots. <laughs> He's been treated special over and over, and he didn't capitalize on this opportunity. That event was for him. It was for him to win. He wants to be Mr. Humble now. But you know he would have been an asshole had he won that fight. Uh, and then he said uh, he would be interested in facing... Uh, McGregor, or Poirier, or Michael Chandler, Charles Oliveira, and Nate, Nate, even Nate Diaz. He said he doesn't see Conor McGregor fight coming to fruition, and if the former two-division champ fights for a title, Gaethje might take some drastic measures. He says, I think I will think about never fighting in the UFC again if he fights for a title. That would be preposterous, Gaethje, Gaethje said. He's sitting at number six. He's won one fight in his entire life in the lightweight division. He picks and chooses who he fights. I would love to fight him, but I don't think it should be next. But he ain't going to fight me. So, Conor McGregor has also come out since the fight and said outright that he was stupid to be going in there with an only boxing mentality. And so it was obvious to me that he was trying to prove that he was the best boxer in MMA because of, you know, Holloway just saying that. Um, you know, it had to be in the back of his mind. And here's a really interesting boxing one. You know, we had the, we had the old connections to the mob with the, the Fertitta brothers when they ran the UFC. Now we've got a guy over in Ireland, uh, Daniel Kinahan. They've actually put out a little bit of a documentary on his connections to the bo boxing world and uh, he's pissed off very pissed off apparently according to this article uh, had to issue a statement and everything uh, claiming he's just a legitimate businessman but uh, and he's on a lot of lists for <laughs> a lot of uh, criminal activity uh, and he's, the picture they got in the article is one of him with uh, Tyson Fury. Unfortunately, you know, great guy. I hate to see him associated with anybody like that. But uh, you know, these people weasel they way, in, way into boxing. They've been in it uh, from the very beginning. You know, it's, it's part of the history, the fabric of boxing from the beginning. <coughs> it's it's unfortunate, but it's kind of like a fact of life. But uh, you know, in recent years they've been able to keep the reputed mobsters out of the boxing world, but uh, this guy's kind of weaseled his way right in. And this is a documentary done by the BBC. It said their program investigates the murky world behind the glamour of the big fights and the suspected gangster who has been welcomed to boxing's top table. So, some pretty crazy stuff. But, uh, more of an overseas problem than over here. I think the uh, if he was somebody was trying to do that over here, I think the FBI would be on him pretty quick. But uh, I don't know. They weren't on the Fertitas too quickly when they were pulling their stuff. Anyway, uh, UFC fighter gone over to uh, bare knuckle fighting. Uh, she's been criticized quite a bit, and this is going to tie into another story that we're going to have to debate a little here in a minute. Not really debate, because I think we all feel the same way, but uh, <laughs> this is just a tie-in. Okay, so Paige Van Zandt. Uh, people are saying, you know, you're a model, you're going to screw your face up, don't go into bare knuckle, it's not your game, like, you know, you're going to get hurt, all these things. Um, she comes back and says, I think the hard thing is the regular fan not necessarily educated in martial arts or educated in the medical field. They see blood and immediately see it as a terrible injury. Whereas for me, I would much rather be cut open than break my arm or break my knuckle or tear my shoulder or tear my knee. Those are all things that take a very long time to heal, whereas a laceration? I got cut in my face in one fight. You can barely tell. And two, I had heard, I heard statistically that scars make you more attractive. It's not a big deal. 
Those heal and you just continue on. Faces heal really well. Your body heals itself really well. So, uh, yeah. Not afraid to get a little cut. Uh, she's coming into her first fight in the uh, Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship. But uh, she's signing with the promotion and nothing to do with proving her toughness. Uh, even though she's been seen what was more of a pretty face than a, than a fighter by some people, some critics. Uh, she's gotten a lot of, she's gotten a lot of good opportunities. I remember talking like months ago about her making more money on Instagram than she does in some of her fights. Uh, so she's got a little bit of the best of both worlds. That's why she gets a lot of this criticism that she's going to get broken or, you know, she's should stick to that, she's better at that, and, uh, you know, if anything, that's probably what's driving her to show people that, no, I'm not just a pretty face, I can be an athlete too, at the sport I love, you know, so more power to her, let's uh, see how it, how it goes, I haven't watched a lot of uh, the, the bare knuckle fighting, I've read a lot about it lately, but, uh, I remember the first couple ones that I watched, and, you know, they're always entertaining, so I'll have to try to tune into the next one, get your debut anyway. I'm sure it'll be going viral, whatever happens. All right. What else we got here? Oh, so here's the next one. I'm going to transition right into... I don't know if you guys have heard about Stephen A. Smith and uh, his comments recently about female fighting. I mean, I've heard of him. I mean, I don't. I didn't hear what he said recently. Yeah, it became a meme this morning. Uh, Rich, did you see what our former guest, Rich, our former guest uh, Heather the Heat Party, had uh-huh. quite a response to him. I haven't seen Twitter. that. Yet. He was on a barrage. Oh, sure. that's classic. Check it out. I'll look it up, but um, I I would have uh, if I had the video. I mean, if I had the audio from um, John Scully versus Ken Shamrock one, I would have. Oh my god! I would have called him out. I would have called Scully out and posted it right on Facebook today uh, when I realized that comment that was going around in a meme from Stephen A. Smith was was recent because. Jesus, that's at the, over 10 years ago now that we did that. And that was Scully's attitude that, back yeah. then. That was Scully's was before exact... Before I was even your co-host, bro. So that's probably 2007, 2007. Yeah, even more than 10 years ago. So um, that was Scully's attitude back then when it was the very early days of female MMA and female boxing, really. The, the, yeah. I mean, it was more far along for boxing, but he was like, you know, I don't want to see a woman get punched in the face. And Ken Shamrock was like, they deserve it. <laughs> you know, they deserve to get punched in the They deserve They work hard, you know, just as hard as men. Scully's like, I just don't want to see it. <laughs> so basically what Stephen A. Smith said is, where I jump off the bandwagon is where they try to engage physically. For example, I don't ever want to see a woman boxing a man. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see a woman in the UFC fighting a man. Even though there are some women out there that will kick the dude's butt. When I think about pugilistic sports, I don't like to see women involved in that at all. I just don't like it. I wouldn't pass, I wouldn't promote legislating laws to prohibit them from doing so. But I don't want to see women punching each other in the face. I don't want to see women fighting in the octagon and stuff like that. That's just me. Now see, everybody forgets the last sentence, that's just me. You know? He's outlined that he doesn't think that anything should be done to stop it. But at the same time, it is a very egotistical opinion, you know, like... And, and it is going to be construed automatically as chauvinistic. Male chauvinist attitude. Just because of the way he worded it, but... I mean, he is saying, qualifying it with, that's just me. You know, you should have a right to your own opinion. That's where I'm only going to give him credit... For that part of it. The rest of it sucks. I mean, it's a bad sentiment to be putting out there in the public eye. Even if it is your feeling, you know, you keep it to yourself. It's not good to be promoting that attitude because uh, you're a public figure. But, you know, and it's funny because 
Patrick, over, what do you feel? Over the last 25 years, you know, I mean, you, I mean, I think all of us, because we, you know, we're old enough, um, you know, we've seen the improvements. Like, I remember back in 95, like, there were some female fights going on, on around that time, but, you know, very low-key in, like, the late 80s, early 90s. You might catch one, like, every so often. It was an anomaly. Um, and then it, it, it's, like, two things in my personal life happened within a few months of each other. My sophomore year at Lock Haven, we had two girls come out for the... We, and, and Dr. Cox tried to run them off, like, no, we don't like whatever. And then they wouldn't leave. So then he really, you know, was trying to make things tough on them. Uh, but then and when, like, the one girl stuck it through. And, you know, she had a few bouts under, you know, ledger. And she worked hard. So Dr. Cox actually softened his, his stance that year. That was 95 to 96. A few months into that, um, when Mike Tyson fought Frank Bruno the second time, our one teammate, you know, because he lived, he was a local guy, had everybody over his parents' house to watch the fight. And um, on that card was the Don King put Christy Martin on there, and she put an Irish girl, Deidre Gogarty, and it was a bloodbath. I mean, girls, I mean, they were, it was a slugfest. It was the best fight of the night. And then everybody was like, oh, my God, but this was, fight was great. And everybody talked about it because not just it was a great fight. It was a great female fight. And then Don King would put Christy Martin on, like, every one of his, his cards. Um, so then it's like, for me personally, it's like I had a female teammate for the first time, and then I was watching a female professional fight it was what which stole the show on a Mike Tyson card and then the third thing that happened right in that same time and I'm actually going to segue this into something else that's very controversial right now is um I was scheduled to fight up at State University New York Westchester in Valhalla uh the guy putting the card on was a friend of Rocky Marciano's his name was Steve Acunto I think we had him on the show before he passed away and so we're driving up from Lock Haven, and there was a bad windstorm that day, and they actually shut down the Tappan Sea Bridge. So the Lock Haven van crosses over the Tappan Sea. My dad, who was about five minutes behind us, him and my trainer and all were coming up. They cross over the Tappan Sea, and a matter of minutes after that, Tappan Sea Bridge gets shut down. So a couple schools can't make it to the show, including Mansfield University which was my opponent, my teammate Jason Plutcher's opponent, and two other opponents. Mansfield can't come now. So now, and then another, you know, a um, couple, couple of local amateurs were going to be on the card, and unfortunately a couple of them couldn't make it due to the, you know, the bridges and all that being shut down. Yeah. So I was forced to box an exhibition against Jason Plutcher. Two of my other teammates were forced to box each other, and then and there was a guy... He, at gunpoint? He came in, kind of came in by himself. Yeah. The guy <laughs> came in by himself, and, you know, he had, like, a long ponytail, and he was sitting there, like, all fired up, like, okay, I'm going to kick somebody's ass today. He was 135 pounds. The only other 135-pounder was a girl named Denise. <laughs> and Denise was a highly touted amateur. So they said, okay, Denise, you're going to box this guy, whatever, in an exhibition. And you can see the guy doesn't want to do it. So now, Denise was a skilled fighter. She turned professional. You know, so she's kind of out boxing this guy. She's really kicking his ass. And everybody in the crowd's laughing at him because you're getting your ass kicked by a girl. Yeah. He lands a right hook in the third round and knocks her down. Everybody boos him. <laughs> and I was like, well, where do you, what, well, it's like, you know, you're in a no-win situation. You're losing to a girl. They're laughing at you. You drop her. You're an asshole. Yeah. You know, you're a bully. That's so, situation. and that's the thing that I'm talking about. Like, they're allowing, like, these transgender people to compete in the opposite gender now letting men who have transferred to women compete with women that's that's in the way and i hate to say this you know because i'm sound like i'm sexist and all that but that's bullshit it is bullshit um that, that would probably yeah. be more popular if stephen king was against a, a man woman <laughs> punching another girl in the face <laughs> it's not so bad when a girl does it to another girl but a man girl i mean oh going to be ruthless if that happens in boxing um uh, i know it's already happened yeah. in wrestling oh, well, i mean we had the example of yeah. fallon fox uh that happened already 
Uh, and now Joe Biden has put the big stamp of approval on it, and, you know, it's on. Uh, and one of the examples that's going around is a guy who uh, came like 300th in the world rankings for hurdles, decided to identify as a girl, came in first place the next year. So it's just ridiculous that you could do that, uh, especially with like no surgery, no paperwork, no evidence that you're taking any kind of um, steroid treatments or whatever they do. Uh, you just decide one day, you wake up, alright, I'm not doing good at the guy's sport, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pretend to be a girl, just so I can be in the record books. You're like, how, how low do you have to be to do something like that? Uh, it's just, just ridiculous. But yeah, I, I do agree that guys shouldn't fight girls, uh, although I would have liked to see Amanda Nunes beat the shit out of Jake Paul. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, that's, that shouldn't happen. Um, it's all fun and games, like, in, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and wrestling and stuff. That's, that's all cool. But once it comes to, like, you know, potential brain damage, death, uh, as a consequence of an injury and that type of fight, yeah, you shouldn't, shouldn't be playing those games. When you look at, like, you know, especially your younger athletes, um, you know, competing in, in amateur-style wrestling, and sometimes you'll get, you know, female versus male, and you're seeing it like in young teens and preteens and all that for schools. You know what? You know what? Yeah. I understand, you know, sometimes there's a lack of, you know, opposition. And sometimes, you know, you get fairly matchups, fairly even matchups. But the thing is, you just brought it up. There's no threat of brain damage, there's no concussive blows to the head. You know, you're waiting on someone to get seriously hurt or possibly killed, and that's going to throw a big black eye on the sport, whether it's boxing or MMA. Um, and then it's going to throw a big black eye into, you know, these equality rights. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so, yeah. So there's, uh, there's some breaking news here on the uh, Mike Tyson front. Uh, apparently he's very close to a deal with a former opponent, former rival. He took a piece out of him. Holyfield. Holyfield. A real deal. Uh, he said, I would say yes, this is Holyfield. I think it's close. I think it's something that we both want to do, and I think it can happen. <coughs> Unfortunately, unlike um, Roy Jones Jr., I don't know if, I, if you guys have seen footage or, you know, anything, any kind of interview with Holyfield recently, but he's not quite as bad as Riddick Bowe, speech-wise or anything, but, um, I don't know, I don't know how well in shape he is, I don't know if he could, like, really sustain ten rounds, even two minutes of, you know, the kind of action that Tyson looks like he's capable of now, uh, but, uh, you know, if it happens, it happens, and I would... I would think that Mike Tyson would pull the Floyd Mayweather act and, and carry him like Floyd carried <laughs> Conor McGregor. Uh, I don't think he really wants to knock him out, even though I'm sure he would like the revenge of beating him. Uh, I don't think he would do that to him. I think they're very good friends now. They don't even really have beef. It's just pretty <laughs> extraordinary if you think about it. Especially they did that commercial with the ear in the box, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talking about burying the hatchet. Uh, that was funny. Anyway. So that could possibly happen. And that's pretty much it for upcoming uh, boxing stuff, past boxing stuff. We've got one big UFC fight coming up. And it's Alistair Overeem in the main event. Against, come on, uh, Alexander Volkanovsky, I believe. Volkov, Volkov. Alistair is forty-seven and eighteen at heavyweight. Uh, Volkov is thirty-two and eight. Volkov's kind of an interesting fighter. He's like one of the. Uh, the last bastions, I guess you could say, of the, you know, the, the one-two straight puncher. 
and, and he throws in some kicks every now and then. He's very good with the kicks, but he's just very, he's not very dynamic, but he's just very technical. He picks his punches, he picks his strikes, and uh, I think it's a perfect matchup for Alistair Overeem. I, I really think it's going to go to decision. Um, but Al- Alistair's really probably at the end of his rope if he wants to make a title run. He's got to run for it now. So he's going to be, I think, trying to, to take Volkov out quick. But Volkov is just a very durable fighter. I don't see him getting knocked out. And I don't see him having the power to knock over him out. I mean, uh, the last time over him got knocked out, I think it was the last second of the fight against Rosenstruck there. So, uh, and that was... Yeah, the, yeah, I remember that. It's a vicious shot. One of the most vicious shots I've ever seen in a fight. So, he's got a chin. But yeah, I, I like Overeem to win the fight, but I think Volkov gives him hell. <coughs> um, yeah, we'll have to put together a little fan duel card on this one to see what the prices are. Uh, also in the main card, the co-main event, we got Corey Sandhagen, very talented, uh, lightweight fighter there, or bantamweight. Uh, Corey is 13 and two, fighting Frankie Edgar, who is 23, eight and one. Uh, and Frankie's been around, been around the block a time or two. He's been in some tough fights. Uh, he's kind of um, into that journeyman area of his career. Uh, this is kind of the word you describe him with now. Uh, he's definitely capable of making a title run still, but uh, you know he's gonna have to string a lot of wins together to uh, make himself give himself a lobbying chance for that. Anyway. Uh, Michael Johnson at lightweight. He's 20 and 16, fighting, uh, speaking of journeyman, uh, this is like, uh, all time journeyman. Clay Guida, 35 and 17. Still, still going at it. Wow, he's still around. Still around. So. <laughs> I'm just wondering when some of these guys you, th- you think have been retired forever, like Forrest Griffin, all of a sudden come back. <laughs> if Clay Guida's still doing it, geez. Anyway, uh, Alexander Pantoja at flyweight is also on the card. He's twenty-two and five, fighting Manel Cape, who is fifteen and four. I don't know much about either one of those guys. Uh, Cody Stammen, nineteen three and one, fighting Axar Askar Askar. <laughs> no picks are on here. Eleven and one. Uh, then we got lightweights Carlos Diego Ferreira, seventeen and two, fighting Benil. Dariush, who is 19, 4, and 1. And those are the main card fights. Preliminary fights. We got Mike Rodriguez, 11 and 5, against Danilo Marquez, who's 10 and 2. Uh, that's at light heavyweight. Catchweight, Devontae Smith, 10 and 2, fighting Justin James, who's 16 and 6. We got women's bantamweights. Um, Carol Rosa, 13 and 3, against Jocelyn Edwards, who is 10 and 2. Molly McCann at women's flyweight, ten and three, fighting Lara Procopio, who's six and one. Then we got featherweight Choi Sung Wu, fighting Yusef Zalal. Featherweight uh, Timur Valiev, fighting Martin Day. Valiev sixteen and two, Day eight and five. And the first fight is Ode Osborne, eight and three, against Jerome Rivera, who's ten and four. So on ESPN Plus or free stream if you know where to go. Because Dana has not shut them down. <laughs> he needs them now. That's when his go on the fritz. Uh, we've also got some one championship stuff coming up. Uh, one championship actually lost money last year. A ninety-eight million dollars in two thousand nineteen. Even though their revenues were up 67%, somehow they lost money on the investment. Um, but it's actually uh, tomorrow night. Uh, one championship will shift its focus to one Super Series. Uh, they're going to host a first live event in a while, Fists of Fury, at the Singapore Indoor Stadium. Uh, actually, this is Friday, February 26th. So this says Unbreakable 3 goes down this Friday. This Fist of Fury thing is in a later date. 
very confusing article. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I don't know what that means. Unbreakable three. I don't know why they're not showing that uh, lineup, but that's tomorrow. One championship. We don't talk about that a lot. But anyway, the 26 is all lined up here. Uh, in the main event, one flyweight kickboxing world champion, Ilias Tweedy Anachi, will defend his belt against number two ranked contender, the kicking machine, Superlek Kiyamutu. Anachi has earned the strap by defeating Petram, the baby shark, Pechi Hindi, in 2018. These are some weird names. Superlek. Uh, and then there's also going to be a clash between one featherweight kickboxing world Grand Prix champion, Giorgio Petrosian, and kickboxing great Dave David Kiria. Uh, also on the card, Victoria the Prodigy Lee, younger sister to one world champion, uh, Christian the Warrior Lee. We'll step into the key circle for the first time. That's the only MMA fight of the evening for that one. Alright, so... One unbreakable three. Real quick on the Let's see the lineup for that tomorrow. There it is. <coughs> Main event, uh, former one atomweight kickboxing and Muay Thai world champion Stamp Fairtex continues her historic quest for a third world title. Also, global superstar Shoko Sato. Anyway, Stan Fairtex versus Aliana Rosonia from the Ukraine. That's at Adam We got Shoko Sato from Japan at Bantamweight against Fabricio Andraj. Rayuto Sawada from Japan against Robin Catalan from the Philippines. Medi Bargai, heavyweight. Versus Kang Jiwon from South Korea. Our guys from Iran. And we got Rahul Raju from India against Ahmed Mujtaba from Pakistan. And Tial Tang from Myanmar. Fighting Paul Lumi from Indonesia. I'm surprised they let uh, Tang out of Myanmar. This guy's going through a coup and everything. He probably don't want to go back. <laughs> He's escaped to Singapore. Anyway, that's it for uh, one championship, and like I said, it's going to be a slow week for boxing. We don't have any highlighted fights for this week at all. Not until the, no, the, fight. the 13th. So that's about fight, it. No mismatch of the week. This is, this is preposterous. I know. Damn oh, COVID. So I guess we could click on, I mean, we could go to the schedule and try to find some. <laughs> Not take Box Rec's word for it, but literally the next um, highlighted fight they have is Thursday the 11th. Uh, well, let's see, Friday. Don't go, go to a specific date. I guess we just have to keep going through the pages. Get my um, email from the zone today, just telling me some upcoming fights. We do got some stuff coming up on the horizon, you know. Um, let me take a look at that right now. Oh, I forgot. Um, like they were talking about the end of the I forgot month. that um, uh, they put the bare knuckle boxing cards on here, so we can at least give people the, uh, the full uh, BKFC card. Paige making her debut in the organization. We'll be fighting a girl named uh, Britton Hart, who is one and two. Uh, Johnny Bedford. Is, uh, I've seen one of his fights. Looks very good in there. He's got very good hands. At lightweight, he's five and zero, oh, fighting a former guest of ours, Dat Nguyen. We really didn't come on the show, but I, I got to interview him backstage at a fight in Boston. Oh, remember that? And uh, that was when I thought uh, I thought um, what's his name? His trainer there was just some guy, his Buddy McGurk. I was just like. Oh. Guy's wearing yeah. his fancy sunglasses. I should have known it was somebody special. And then I'm in the middle of an interview in Dat, and I was like, 
he just kept saying buddy this and buddy that and I just put two and two together and I said oh jeez that was Buddy McGurk <laughs> didn't even know it I went up to Buddy McGurk and I was just like uh, hey how you doing can I interview your fighter <laughs> he's usually probably used to people coming up and asking him for the interview I, like was, I didn't even know who he was because he was like, like yeah uh, he probably gave one of you like, yeah, sure, asshole. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, no, but he probably was happy because he's probably so used to getting bugged and he don't want to do the interview. He'd rather have a fighter do his interview. But, you know, at the same time, he had to have felt a little bit snubbed. <laughs> anyway, uh, that is probably going to be a, going for an uphill fight here. Uh, he's very limited experience in bare knuckle, but he also has more experience just boxing. So, Johnny Bedford being 5-0, and oh, whoa, this is going to be a vicious one. But that's been in some tough ones. So, yeah, this is really going to be one I'm going to have to turn into, tune into because Paige and Dat on the same card here. I got some personal interest in seeing how this goes down. Uh, Martin Brown, 1-0 and oh against Zachary Zane, making his pro debut. Travis Thompson, 2-3 and three against David Allen Morgan, making his pro debut. John Chalbeck at Super Lightweight uh, in his debut against Greg Bono in his debut. And we got heavyweights Lorenzo Hunt, 4 and 1, fighting Robert Morrow, who's 0 and 1. Chris Jensen at heavyweight, 1 and 0, fighting Dylan Kleckler, who's 1 and 0. Jared Grant at lightweight, 2 and 0, fighting Brandon Lambert, who's making his debut. Flyweight Taylor Starling against Teresa Sagala, both of them making their debut. Light heavyweights Jeff Bailey and Andrew James Lipton. Lipton? Jeff Bailey's making his debut. Lipton's 0-3. He is the, uh, the, the bare-knuckle boxing equivalent of an opponent, I guess, now. Uh, Chris Levin. Chris the Crippler Levin. Uh, was not able to fight in Bellator. They wouldn't clear him medically, but he's able to fight in the bare-knuckle fighting, so I don't know what's going on with that. But He's 2-1 so far at heavyweight, uh, fighting Quentin Henry, who's 2-0, oh, so this should be a tough one for him of the test, maybe. Heavyweight's Haim Gozali, making his debut. He does have fighting experience. I believe he's an MMA fighter. Uh, against John McAllister, who's 0-4. That's rough. That's a tough start to a fair enough report there. That's the last fight on the card there. But the first fight already started. Alright, so that's Friday. Not a lot else going on. Fights in Germany here Saturday. Yeah, somehow they forgot Austin Trout is fighting this weekend down in Chihuahua, Mexico. 32 and 5 against Juan Armando Garcia, who's 21, 7 and 2. At Walter Wait. And lo and behold, there is a Jesus fight. There's a Jesus fight every week if you look for one. <laughs> I think we've only had like one or two exceptions. But Brian Mosinos, he is 19 and 2 at flyweight, fighting Jesus Lemus, who is 11 and 2. He's got a good record there. He's not going to need a miracle, I don't think. You know what I've noticed on BoxRec sometimes? It's like they have like a highlighted fight, but a lot of times if it's if it's not like a televised card or not a title fight, yeah. like they they won't put it in the highlight until it looks like there's really nothing going on this weekend, but. You know, as they always say in the old professional wrestling business, if it's not on TV, you know, it, it, it doesn't count. Right. Um, I was actually, I pulled up my the zone, and I, you know, I find humor in everything. You know, that's just me. So I'm looking at, you know, they got some cards come, coming up, and we got, um, you know, on the, the 27th, we got Canelo Alvarez and a guy named Avni Yildirim, <laughs> who... Who is twenty one and two? Hope it's like mandatory or a keep busy. Is that we how got, you really uh, pronounce the... it? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> well, here, I'm going to put you another name on the thirteenth. We got Joseph Diaz, um, and he's um, in his first defense of the title against undefeated guy named Shavkat Rakamov. You know, but my favorite's going to be coming up in a minute. We got uh, Josh Warrington and Mauricio Lara on the thirteenth. Um, you know, so we had, like I said, then a couple ones. And on the, the 27th, 
It says, I see Joseph Parker versus F.A. What's this? Is he fighting a free agent? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm used to seeing TBA or TBD. I scroll down. I'm like, wait, there's a person's picture. I'm like, what the hell is this? Because it's, it's the guy's name. Junior Fa. F.A. Fa. I thought it was free agent. I'm like, oh, he's going to fight a free agent. Like, you know? <laughs> Yeah, Maybe a guy not put it onto a promotional contract. <laughs> get some rare names. Rare names. Yeah. We found a ton of them on this show. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it for uh, this weekend. We got one other Carlos Molina fight in Mexico. That's pretty much the only other one. And he's not fighting anymore special as far as uh, it's actually get the same amount of losses eleven. So that's about it. Till next week I suppose. I'm gonna look for a guest really hard this week. Uh, definitely uh, oh here's mismatch of the week by the way. Just caught that at the end of the list here. Yeah, might as well do that. We got the other fight we can get in somebody's always gotta go fight but Definitely the mismatch of the week. Gotta have faith at Cruiserweight here in Germany. Faith Altun Kaya. And when I say you gotta have faith, I say you gotta have your bet on faith because faith is 22 and 0. And I don't know if it's a girl or a boy because the other opponent's name is Stretton. I don't know if that's a girl or a boy's name. <laughs> no, it's Fatih. F A T I H. I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Fatih Altunkaya. Cruiserweight, 22 and 0. Fighting Stretton Vujakic. He's 0 and 1. No wonder Fatih is 22 and 0. He's fighting everybody who's 0 and 1. Uh, but yeah, that's a mismatch of the week for sure. I don't think I could find a better one if I tried. <coughs> there are a lot of opponents on this card, though. 6-0 against 0-1, 4-0 against 0-8, 6-0 against 0-4. I want to fight on this card. <laughs> Give me one of those people. I just got to go to Germany, I guess. Which means I probably have to enlist, you know, because Joe Biden's keeping all the troops over there. <laughs> Carlos Molina, oh, before we go, I was going to say, Carlos Molina, 36-11-2, fighting in Ocampo, Mexico. He's fighting Edgar Ortega. Probably no relation to Brian from the UFC, but he's 18-11, uh, and 11, Edgar. He's lost five of his last six. So, I think Carlos is going to beat the brakes off of him in the main event here. <laughs> That's about it. Unless I've forgotten something. So we'll talk about UFC next week, and we'll definitely get a guest. I'll, I'll find somebody. Uh-huh. Maybe I'll get Stephen Smith against John Scully, now that he's changed his opinion on women's fights. <laughs> <laughs> John Scully's got a very famous and popular uh, Facebook account now. I think if we got him on the show again, we'd probably get about 5,000 listeners. John's <laughs> well, a big deal. Yes, he is. He creates these great discussions too, with these little quirky things. He, he does. does. Just and, and, and you know, and it's funny because it's like you know he talks about the stuff that he has like banned. So it's like like he like the mispronunciation of lose and loose. He's <laughs> like you didn't lose the fight, you lo- you lose a fight. Yeah. You know, he just puts stuff on it, and I'm like, he, he keeps me entertained. Yes. And uh, you know, it's just just like. Kind of like uh, reminds me sometimes of um, Kevin Nealon when he used to do the Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy. <laughs> it's like, this weird shit he puts on there, like, uh, is it a sin to kill like bugs? Like, thou shalt not kill. Does that apply to like bugs? Can we kill bugs? <laughs> <laughs> and that starts this whole discussion. Oh, it's crazy. Uh, and it always makes me think back to one of the first videos that he posted of himself uh, out in Vegas. And he was, like, going up the escalator and across the road on the bridge. And he just starts stalking this guy with a sign about, you know, the end of times and 
you know, you have to bow down to God or whatever. So he, he just accosts this guy who usually is probably used to accosting other people. And he sits there for like 30 minutes just grilling this guy on his religion. <laughs> And he filmed the whole thing. And this guy's like trying to defend his whole religious views, and Scully's just like, "But what about this? And what about this?" <laughs> this is classic. Uh, I had um, I had fun last week. You know, I've been saying how I messed with those um, you know, car warranty scammers. So I had one call last week, and usually I use the the lines from my cousin Vinny, uh, the 1964 Buick Skylark, blah 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 blah. Blah, and then they say, hey, you don't qualify. Then I yell at them because I'm not qualified to get scammed. And then I, I threatened to sue them because they offered me a warranty. And now they're retracting it. So that's usually my fun. Like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to become a preacher. So I go on the phone. The person's like, you know, obviously a very thick, you know, Middle Eastern or Indian accent. Hello, my name is John. I, go, I need to make a model of your car. I'm like, John, do you love Jesus Christ? I said, John, because, you know, all we need in this world is uh, the love of Jesus Christ. Right. The guy's like, um, yeah. I'm like, praise the Lord. You know, and then he's like, I need to make a model of your car. I'm like, why do I even need a warranty when I got the love of Jesus Christ protecting me and my vehicle? He was like, um, 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 have a nice day. Oh, my God. I had so much fun with these. I had one the other day, and they were going to do something. I was like, hey, man, how you doing? And the guy was like, oh. He was like sitting there, and I'm like, and then he started stuttering. So then I used the line from Billy Madison. And I'm like, today, Junior. <laughs> I get it. Oh, I'm like, I get upset now when my scam blocker boxes these calls. No, 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 no. I'm like, I'm enjoying them. <laughs> yeah. I got, I got uh, suckered in by one of these um, roofing ads. You know, Facebook now will target you if you, like, look yeah. something up. You know, like something that has to do with a subject, you know, they'll start posting a lot of those ads, knowing you want that, knowing you're thinking about that. So I kept getting all these roofing things after I was looking at fixing my roof at the house. Uh, so eventually I clicked on this ad that it was supposed to be like, oh, we can ha maybe possibly help you out and give you a, a discount or a free roof or something like that. Next thing you know, they got me on the phone and they're setting me up for an appointment. Wow. Uh, to look at the house, and I'm so busy, you know, I'm like, I'm probably going to miss this, but I'm going to make the appointment anyway, <laughs> see what happens, and so, supposedly somebody comes to my house, they miss me, they call me back, then I find out it's Home Advisor the whole time, pretending to be the company that does it, it was Home Advisor, so, like, literally within the last three weeks since I've done it, I've had, like, seven different companies call me roofing companies trying to get me to sign up for a deal and I only ever scheduled an appointment with one of them after the first phone call and I've actually told these people to put me on their do not call list now I'm getting emails from them again all of a sudden and it's like if I had known this was home advisor I never would have set it up and then I see on Facebook an ad for home advisor, of course, you know. And it's got all these comments. So I click on the comments, it's gonna put a bad comment on there saying these people just harass you and they don't even really, you know, have your best interest in mind. And, and lo and behold, every comment is negative. It's like, why would you guys even put out ads? You're gonna get yeah. trashed. Like everybody's saying, even business owners are like, they give you bogus um, appointments. <clears throat> But I had a girl this morning, well, you know what? supposedly a girl, on Facebook from, like, Iceland or some shit. I don't even know where she was from. It looked like a legitimate profile and an older woman. So she tries to add me as a friend. I accept it. And, you know, immediately, when somebody immediately starts texting you that you don't know, you've just added. Yep. Well, probably a scam. Like, 19 times out of 20, unless, like... Five minutes into the conversation, they're like, oh, yeah, I know you from high school. Might have forgotten me. Maybe then, but most of the time, it's somebody you don't know is just going to be a scammer. So, sure enough, oh, my husband is sick, and uh, he's, he died, and, and he 
left me all this money, but I can't access it, and I thought you were an honest person, and I'm like trying to tell it, look, this, you, you got the wrong person. I'm an investigative reporter, and I know all this stuff about, you know, this is, this is a scam. Oh, no, by the grace of God, you will help me. <laughs> so I did what I know is going to immediately, I know Facebook's not going to act. I know if I report it, they're just going to say, oh, we find nothing wrong with this. Because they don't look at your your text messages, you know. Like if they looked at bit, looked at your messenger record and saw what these people are trying to do, they'd probably eliminate the account right away. But they just go look at the profile. If the profile looks legit, they're not going to do anything. So what I do is yeah. I, I go on there and I post it. I post a link and I say, "Hey, this lady's trying to scam people." And I got five thousand people that are friends, basically, and a lot of lot about half of that of followers that are actually going to see it. Um, so. All these people are going to see it, they're going to click on it, and they're all going to report it at the same time. So that's what gets it shut down. And then, at the, when she kept, like, insisting, you know, oh, you can trust me, you can trust me, I said, I am tracking your location right now so I can report you to your country's authorities, you know, the law enforcement or whatever. <laughs> Immediately shut down. Immediately. She probably shut it down herself. So that was fun. I woke up to that this morning. Are you, let me ask you this, Rich. Are you a Seinfeld fan? Yes, big time. Okay, I'm going to send you one of these right now. Because um, my my friend Mike, him and his wife, well, not much as much him, but his wife loves Seinfeld. Oh, so, and I found this out one day. She showed me a family picture of her, Mike, and Dominic. And she goes, isn't that the most beautiful family photo you've ever seen? And I said, yeah, it's breathtaking. Hmm. Which was what the doctor said about the real ugly baby. <laughs> and she was like, you son of a bitch. And I'm like, oh, so you know what I'm talking about. She goes, I love Seinfeld. <laughs> so now, I'm on a Seinfeld fan page on Facebook, and people will do the same thing, where like, they get these scammers, but they'll use all Seinfeld references on them. <laughs> so a person will be like, oh, whatever, like, are, are you single? And the guy will be like, yeah, I was engaged, but my wife died from uh, looking for well, toxic poison envelopes that I bought. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And then it's Oh, I'm over. I'm over in Ghana right now. Uh, do you have WhatsApp? And he's like, what? What's what's uh, what's oh, an yeah. app? She tried you know, to do that like, too. Don't mess with him. And then it's yeah. So he's like, oh, we're really hungry. Can you send us money to, to get food? And he's like, what would you like? A big salad or a calzone from Paisanos? And he's doing all these signs of references. Like it's like ten screenshots, maybe <laughs> more. So it for my friend's wife was I actually took the screenshots. And I actually made it into one single PDF so I could email it to her just so she could read it and just crack the fuck up. I'm going to send you one of them just so that you can watch it. It's like, oh, my God, these are great. Because normally, like, I get them. And I had one the other week. As you know, I like that comedian, Anthony Rodea. I was on the phone with him a few weeks ago. So he had posted something on his comedy page. And I commented on it. I said, hey, you know, whatever. Thank you for the, you know, the... um." Thing you did the, uh, the cameo video you did for me I appreciate it well somebody commented like on me and like when they commented they they actually tugged me in the comments They're like hey Tony Penny Caroline if you're interested in you know um, um, doing whatever like with Bitcoin and this and that and, that, and I'm like listen buddy don't scam me I'm not in the mood for it this is not a scam it's guaranteed <laughs> and I pulled the line from Tommy Boy I pulled <laughs> Tommy Boy and I'm like listen buddy if you want if if you want me to take a dump in a box and mark it guaranteed, I will. I got the spare time. <laughs> yeah, God did that to me the other day on Bitcoin. Uh, and they, they sent me right to the website. And I was already interested in Bitcoin because it, it is uh, its very interesting to me. At, at Probably like two weeks ago, I would have told you, go screw yourself. It's a scam. The whole thing is a scam. It's never going to amount to anything. It's just made up. You know, but this whole GameStop thing happened. Now I'm watching CNBC like five, six hours every day. And Bitcoin is in the corner with Dow Jones, NASDAQ. Bitcoin's right in the corner all day long. And I know when it was 14,000, people were trying to hype it up. And I was kind of like, yeah, maybe there is something to it. Now it's up to $37,000 per Bitcoin, you know, and everybody would think, well, how can I even get in on it if it's just $37,000 like, you know, for one? Well, you know, if 
you look into it, you can get fractions of it. Um, so I started to research it and started to, you know, come up with little pieces of the story, how it got started. Uh, and it actually got started by one of the biggest exchanges was uh, a bunch of card guys, Magic the Gathering, they played. Um, and so it was called MTG Gox. At Mount Gox, it was called. MTG stood for Magic the Gathering. So it was, it was literally like a bunch of geeks got together and, and figured this whole thing out. But their idea was to make it decentralized so that there would be no, like, big overseers. The people that run it are basically programmers and computers. And, and it's just all supposed to kind of work on its own. I don't know. It's very complicated stuff, you know. But what's making me think it's legitimate now is there's all kinds of moves being made like PayPal. I have a PayPal account. PayPal now has a whole crypto side to it. For days when I saw it going up, I'm like, well, how the hell do I get involved in this? You know, it seems like there's all these barriers and none of the, all these websites that say they all these apps that say they take PayPal I can't get them to take PayPal. Then I log into my PayPal account and they say, it says, buy crypto. And the message, I'm like, what the hell? How come you didn't, it's been like that since October. You can buy crypto right on PayPal. So I was like, screw it. I'm going to put like a hundred bucks in and just see what happens. And, you know, hold on to it for a little while. Uh, but the big thing is, I've learned, is that you have to find a way to earn it. Uh, like the guy from the NFL recently uh, just said he wanted to be paid in Bitcoin. One of the first times it's ever happened. Or it was the first time it ever happened. Uh, it was another thing that made me go, oh shit, maybe this is legitimate. Um, but really what turned my head to it was one guy who was one of the big hedge fund guys they had on CNBC. And he said this line that was basically like, you know, why would you not invest in it? It's like, you know... It's way better than trying to invest in the dollar when, you know, you could have a very quick situation where this whole economy could collapse. And this thing is worldwide. It's not just based in the United States. He said, I do business with it all the time, you know, which helps me be able to, you know, justify having it on hand all the time. Uh, but on top of that, he said, someday, possibly very soon... Having regular money is going to be like having Confederate money. <laughs> Whereas having Bitcoin is going to be ironclad. It's, there's no way it can collapse. Like the programmers are not going to destroy it. Uh, and and the, the people that are buying it and trading it are not going to be able to destroy it because it's so decentralized. So that's the joy of it. But the, the other part of it is because it's computerized and all that, it's totally unpredictable. It goes kind of all over the map sometimes. There was, there was one point where, or a couple points where it lost like half its value overnight. Uh, so like if some, if the United States government decides to come in and thinks it's a threat and, and, and shuts down all these companies trying to use it now, you know, you could have a situation where it totally collapses. But all indications look like it's going to get completely legitimized now. They're talking about making uh, bank accounts in regular banks where you can hold Bitcoin, uh, you know, run-of-the-mill, big household name banks. So, uh, yeah, I just put a hundred bucks in and just want, I'm going to watch it, see what it does. Uh, but I've, I wouldn't uh, trust anybody that tells you, oh, you know, on the internet, like on, on Facebook, trying to message you about it, because they're in it for the wrong reasons. But if you go out there and do your own research... Exactly. Try to learn the story. It's, it's very fascinating. Like Honestly, like you start thinking about it. It's, it's, it's like the damn Matrix <laughs> movie. You know? It doesn't make any sense to somebody that isn't a computer geek, really. But if you get into the story of it and you start looking at the news hints, it's like, literally, this is the only day I've ever seen it down in the 24-hour percentage change. And it's down like a 1.33%. Uh, but the last, like, four or five days, it's been going up on average of, like, five or six percent a day. <coughs> uh, so I put a hundred bucks in, like, three or four days ago, 
And I've averaged between like five and seven dollars profit since then. On a hundred bucks. It's not bad, but you know, it's a long haul stock. And they're saying it could go up to as much as no, it's not a stock, it's Bitcoin, but anyway, it's like digital gold they call it now. It's some people that are being ridiculous uh, are saying it could go up as high as one hundred fifty-six thousand dollars for one bitcoin. I only have a fraction fraction of one, but you can also do stuff like uh, you know, like write about it. They said uh, one of the, there's like four or five articles about like how you can earn bitcoin, and the whole mining thing is what loses most people. To mine for bitcoin, you have to have some very sophisticated computers to make any real money. Uh, or you have to engage in like pool computing with other people and have one computer that's really powerful dedicated to doing that all day. And even then, I mean, it sounds like it's very technical. So nobody wants to get involved in that if you're not a computer geek and you know are all into that. So they're making it easier and easier to buy. That's where people are going to get into it. But this whole GameStop thing had more and more people willing to come out there and say that Bitcoin is a good investment because it proved that this system is culpable and capable of breaking down. Uh, and, it, and it could happen very quickly. These guys from Reddit basically exposed a big flaw in the system. And, and it probably burned some of them, you know, some of the people that went along with the wave because now the stock's down to almost 50 bucks. Just, just today, but uh, you know, a lot of those stocks are down. But at the same time, like it did teach these hedge funds a big lesson. So now they're going to have to be more careful about, you know, what they put out there. And you know, if they're going to short a company, that's one thing. You know, I don't know if that should be illegal or not. Some people say it's a good thing. Some people say it's a bad thing. But it, it, you probably shouldn't be advertising it that you're shorting it. You probably shouldn't be putting it out there. Because that does probably put the company in a bad light if they're not really intending to shut down anytime soon and you're out there trying to trying to look like they're going to go bankrupt tomorrow. Um, and you, you've you actually seen GameStop supposedly just, just totally rearrange their entire board. They put some new people in new places and, and they're, they're looking to really get into the digital sales space to make up for the brick and mortar problems they have. So... I mean, I'm not saying invest in GameStop. It's probably only going to be a $50 stock for a long time, but uh, it's gone down quite a bit enough that maybe uh, now it could be a long hold. But before, it was absolutely ridiculous. The valuation was like $22 million for this company. So, uh, it was interesting. Yeah, it was like it reminded me of um, trading places. Yeah, yeah. But it was interesting watching it uh, and how these companies like Robinhood just decided arbitrarily to like, you know, oh, we're only going to allow you two stocks here and two stocks there. And, and they purposely found ways to make it look like it was for another reason. Oh, you know, we, don't, we don't have enough capital to support these crazy trades. Now they're up to allowing you to have 100 shares because they know that nobody's going to buy it anymore. And it's not going to cause the hedge funds to buy it because the short squeeze is pretty much over. They've been exposed as trying to do it. So it's, you know, nobody in their right mind is trying to trying to get in on it. But what I thought was really interesting the other day is, is Elon Musk came out and said he's going to take a break from Twitter. And here's something interesting. Uh, I think it was yesterday Elon Musk tried to do a test launch and Joe Biden's administration prevented him from doing it. Uh, and so there might be a rocky relationship between the administration and Elon Musk. And you know how they got him, they got Trump's account canceled. You know, the Democrats basically canceled yep. culture, got rid of him. So I think yep. they threatened, somebody threatened. Elon Musk because of his tweets because his tweets were moving the market he actually put a hashtag Bitcoin on his description of his Twitter and that was like the day it went nuts like two days before I got involved in it and uh, so he's capable with one tweet of moving stocks like you wouldn't believe and even he was in on the GameStop you know phenomenon encouraging people to do it 
So, I think somebody from the SEC, Biden's administration, was sent to go see him and talk to him about his, you know, some of these tweets. And one of the ones is this doggy coin. It's pretty funny. It's supposed supposedly created as a joke. And it's, it's only at like five cents right now. But overnight, he sent it up 75% because he just did a tweet about it. So whatever. They did talk to him and they did suspend his flight. He probably was pissed off enough to just, you know, start tweeting again. Say, fuck it. But, uh, yeah, who knows what's going on behind the scenes. But Elon Musk is just basically, you know, one of seen as one of the smartest people in the world, and people are just willing to follow whatever the heck he wants to do. But supposedly what caused the rift between him and Joe Biden was some kind of speech he gave about Mars. When they get to colonize Mars, he says they're not going to go by regular Earth laws. And, of course, you know, if the, if the NASA and the U.S. government is supporting Elon Musk and kind of endorsing this whole Mars thing, we're going to want it to be American laws, right? <laughs> you know, the guy, we're the government. Um, and Elon Musk wants to be like free-for-all, do-your-own-thing, I guess, up there. So I think that might be where they're kind of rubbing elbows or bumping heads. Anyway, we always seem to find a way to get political on this show. <laughs> we always do. We're <laughs> gonna have to make it the, the combat and politics show. <laughs> Are you still with us, Tom? Yes, sir. What do you think about Bitcoin? I'm afraid of it. Afraid of it, yeah. And here, here is my thing. You know, if any any of us got the great tip, right? Hey, man, I heard if you do this, you can get this. My problem is, is when a random stranger that you don't even know finds you on on a um, you know a celebrity um, you know page, and you comment something like, "Hey, good luck in your show this weekend." And the person's like, "Hey, Tony Panikow, how are you? I don't know you, but I want to you know give you a tip and you know do some investing with me." Who the fuck are you? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I'm going to trust you. Get the hell out of here. And that's, and that's when I make fun of these people. Um, you know, like I said, yeah, I, I could take a dump in a box, market guaranteed, buddy. Like, I trust you. Get the fuck out of here. Um, you know, but hey, if I find something like, I lucked into one at work 10 years ago. I've made, I'm not going to say I've made a shit ton of money where I'm going to retire off it, but I've helped myself. Yeah. Um, You know, but, but, you know, random strangers aren't asking you to invest with them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can't trust just uh, people that are trying to sell you a multi-level marketing deal or anything like that. Yeah, there's no there's no quick money. I mean, there really isn't. Uh, this this GameStop thing was quick money for the people that were, were perfect with their timing. But, exactly. I mean, even the people that did it were probably lucky if they they cashed out at the right time. Because they, yeah. they probably didn't yep. anticipate the day that Robin Hood was just going to shut shit down. You know, so... Yeah. I mean, and, I'm, and I'm sure a lot, of, a lot more people that are, like, late to the game are hearing, like, oh, my God, something's happening, and they buy high, and then it drops low, and it's never going to recover from that, and you're losing a shit ton of money. Yeah. That's why I only put a hundred bucks in Bitcoin. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna try to figure out the ways to earn it. So it seems to be the, the more the more um, solid way to go because you're not putting as much risk into it, like you know, physical money. Uh, so I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna see how it goes, you know. And they say that's the that's the attitude to have with it too. Is like you kind of want to just look at it as like a stock, even though it's not want to hold on to it for the time that it is maybe more not only more valuable but more uh, accepted at different places so like if it's as accepted as PayPal someday which PayPal is getting around PayPal is actually a stock to buy if you can afford it Uh, they keep mentioning it on CNBC and it has a lot to do with Venmo which is actually owned by PayPal I didn't even know that until 
the other day. But Venmo is getting very popular too. It's a changing world. A lot of technologies switching over. Yeah. This 5G thing has a lot to do with it. But anyway, till next week. All right, come in, Mom. Have a good All night. All right, guys. And, and I don't know what we're going to do this weekend, but enjoy the Super Bowl. Yes, yes. I, I guess I'm going to be rooting for Tom Brady. But, uh, you know, i got to try to be objective at the same time as I pick my FanDuel team because uh, I know that, you know, when the Patriots are involved in a game and I have to do a lineup on just one game, I tend to favor the Patriots a little too much. So this is going to be like half right, of the right. Patriots on the Tom Brady's team, you know. Freaking Tom and uh, Gronk. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, re- I'm reading through one of my blocks. Yeah. I got about 150 two hundred dollars in block pools right now, so I'm going to need to keep at least two different quarters to break even. <laughs> All right. How do you? What's your prediction? Do you have a prediction score wise? What do you think it's going to be? Uh, 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 yeah, I, I think it's going to be something along the line. I'm going to. I think the Chiefs are going to win. It's going to be a close game. Uh, I think it's going to be something along the lines of like a 34-31. Something along those lines. Um, so I'll go with that. Now, now I got to run downstairs and see if I have Chiefs four, Bucks one on any of my block pools. And I'm like, oh, shit, I got to change my scoring out of state seven thirty five because I have a seven and a five. I'm going to say um, thirty five twenty seven. Tampa Bay, and it's. Ooh. It's going to come down to the defense. The defense on Tampa Bay is going to make a couple big turnovers happen. Probably an interception and at least at least one interception. Could possibly be two or an interception and a fumble. That's what I'm going to say. I'm going to get that specific. Because that defense is crazy lately. And they're at home. And you cannot underestimate that. Tom Brady at home is invincible. Just about. I think he's lost like two games in the last century and, and, at home. And uh, what score did you say again? 30... 35 27. Okay, five, 35 27. That would be one of my former co work. No, I looked at the wrong block. Uh, 35 27. Oh, no, we can't have that. That's my friend Mike, Dominic's father. We can't <laughs> let him win. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> That's funny. My I said thirty one. Jesus Christ, that's Mike's wife. We don't want her to win. Christ. <laughs> okay, that changed thirty seven, thirty four. Oh yeah, we we want to go with that. That's me. Yeah, we'll go with that one. Thirty seven, thirty four. Oh, that's a tough one. That'd be real close. <laughs> thirty seven, thirty four. That's like overtime win by a field goal. No, four points. That's four points. So it'd have to be like a touchdown while they're behind by three. That's crazy. Could happen though. I mean, and Tom Brady's the king of the comeback too. So, oh yeah, it's going to be crazy. It's gonna be a crazy well, I guess it was three years ago today that the Eagles Patriots game, and the Eagles were up by eight, and Brady got down to the forty nine yard line, and he chucked that one to the end zone. Gronk and Gronk had a hand on it, and thankfully, as soon as he touched it, they just kind of just pulverized him to the ground, and then let the ball, you know. Ball harmless yeah, and the thing about Tampa Bay that I like is that every game there's a different star. You know, there's t- people just capable of, all right, this guy, the, the big guy's getting covered, so I'm going to be the star today. Uh, whoever's got the best coverage guy on him it can take a back seat, and somebody else will step up and be the star. Of the game. You know, there was somebody was making a comment the other day because Tampa being the home team in their home stadium. Elected to wear their white road jerseys, and I know a couple years ago when it, when the game was in Minnesota, the Vikings made it to the NFC Championship, and they were favored over the Eagles. The Vikings would have been the away team in their home stadium, which would have been kind of odd. Um, but people are like, why is Tampa being the home team in their home stadium electing to wear their road jerseys? I'm like, well, it makes sense, yeah. you know, because every playoff game this year they've been the road team and they've worn their white jerseys and they're three and out 
<laughs> you know, so it's kind of like, it's like one of those crazy superstitions. Like, I remember Pittsburgh did it like 15 years ago. They were the sixth seed. They were, you know, all all road games. Every game there were their white jerseys. They were the home Super Bowl team. They're like, no, we're not wearing our black jerseys. We're going white because we're embracing that underdog mentality. Right. A couple of years ago, uh, um, New England elected to wear their white jerseys as the home team against the Eagles because they were like, we're undefeated in our road whites on the Super Bowl. Um, and they wanted to, you know, and that was like a good luck charm to them. <coughs> cough, cough, didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm betting Tom Brady's a little bit superstitious about some things. But anyway, all right, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, let's hope we get uh, all right, guys. big Tom Brady Have win. Um, I don't care if he's gotten too many of them. He deserves another one. This is just an incredible thing that he's done with his team. And uh, he's talking about playing a long time, so um, it's not a bad bar hey, to set. We didn't get a score from Tom. Oh, yeah, Tom. Tom what was guy. your score prediction? I like it. He left us. Oh shit! Okay, <laughs> one of my blocks. <laughs> Tom only uh, likes the Cleveland teams. Anything. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, there he is. All okay, right. Well, have a good night, man. I'll talk to you next week. Alrighty. Later. Adios.